Welcome to the 2022 Texas Tribune Festival. I'm Eleanor Klibanoff, the women's health reporter here at the Tribune, and we are so excited you are joining us for three days of important conversations on politics and policy with some of the biggest names in Texas and from around the country. I am personally very excited for this panel, one of seven we're presenting virtually, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Cecile Richards, the co-founder of Supermajority and former president of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. She's also now working as the national campaign finance chair for the Beto O'Rourke campaign, hoping Democrats can reclaim the governorship for the first time since her own mother held the role in the early 1990s. Cecile, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eleanor. You know, uh, when this interview airs, we're recording this in early September, but when it airs, uh, we will be about three months out from the U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade and allowing states to set their own laws around abortion access. You know, Texas, a state geographically larger than the country of France, has completely outlawed the procedure, leaving about 10 percent of women of reproductive age in this country without access to abortion within the state's borders. I want to talk about how we got here and where we're going, but to start, Tell me about where you were when that decision came down and what your reaction was. I was at my apartment and incredibly, I the night before I'd actually been on the phone with various um, doctors and uh, folks in Texas who work on abortion rights. We had no idea the decision was coming down the next day. And it was the first time I realized that not only was abortion going to become potentially completely illegal when this decision came down in Texas, but that also, the ability of people to even get information about where they could go outside of Texas was also going to end. And in fact, um, one of the women I was speaking with who works with an abortion fund that tries to assist people who are leaving the state said it is going to become a blackout. This is a state where you can no longer tell anyone any information about um, how to access safe and legal abortion, even though, of course, it would be legal in uh, many states in this country. And I just went to bed thinking it's going to be so much worse than I realized. And then the next morning, of course, the, the decision came down. And interestingly, I mean, Texas, we were somewhat prepared because, of course, abortion had been virtually illegal since September 1st. I think the rest of the country, even though we'd all been saying, this is coming, this is coming, uh, it is going to dramatically change a life for people in this country. Uh, I think it wasn't until that decision came down that panic uh, set in all across America. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Sort of the ripple effects of watching, you know, different different groups sort of come to terms with this was right. really interesting. Yeah. You know, in Texas, when we talk about abortion bans, there's sort of we have to hold two truths simultaneously. I mean, on the one hand, we know these bans are very unpopular. About 80 percent of Texans want abortion to be allowed in at least some form. Correct. On the other hand, Republicans control virtually every facet of state right. government. And in many cases, sort of the most extreme arms of the Republican Party are pulling to the right on those issues. For people who fall into that first camp, I mean, what's the move right now? How do you sort of mobilize against these bans and against that Republican, you know, powerhouse? Right. Well, it's, I mean, I think Texas is just a microcosm of the United States in that regard. So I don't know that it's that, that much different here. It's just that we, as you said, you know, we're kind of a, ahead, of the, ahead of the game by um, not only passing, of course, the six-week abortion ban, the bounty hunter ban, uh, now this more egregious um, uh, full ban, um, but it is, it, it, so people have now seen what it looks like. And I think the most important thing when I, when I, you know, when we knew the Texas ban was coming into effect, to me it was, you know, all of these Republican elected officials in Texas who for years have, you know, proudly said they were pro-life and they wanted to end abortion access uh, and make it illegal. It was sort of a free it was sort of a free thing for it. They could just say that because they knew there were really no consequences. And um, now I feel like they are a bit like the dog who caught the bus, right? Now they own it. And of course, it wasn't too long into the ban that we saw a young woman in South Texas arrested for um, after having been turned in apparently by, her, by the local um, hospital to the sheriff's office for having allegedly tried to terminate a pregnancy. The stories are coming out now about not just um, what this means in theory, but what it means in practice. I remember talking to a high-risk OBGYN in Dallas and not long ago, and she said it is horrifying. You know, she deals with women with very complex pregnancies, high-risk pregnancies. 
She said, I'm not even able to tell them uh, what they can possibly do and what their options are. And so I feel like, um, you know, there is the political side of this, which of course is making sure that people know this didn't just come down from the Supreme Court. This was the goal of the Texas Republican Party, uh, and now they have been successful, um, but also making sure that people understand the real human impact. And that is something that is already happening. We're seeing it across the country. You know, a 10-year-old, you know, um, survivor of sexual assault having to go to Indiana uh, for an abortion, which soon will be illegal um, in that state. This is not the kind of country that Texans want, and it's not the kind of country Americans want. I guess, so to answer your question, the long-term question is, how long can a minority government, a government that is essentially going against the will of the people, stay in power? And that, to me, is a long-term risk for the Republican Party, not only here in Texas, but across America. Right, right. And on that, I mean, you are working to get Beto O'Rourke elected to yes. governor, um, which, you know, would be a, a significant political p power shift, you know, Correct. after several decades. A much of... <laughs> needed one. And yes, a big one. <laughs> um, I mean, how do you see abortion access playing out in that race? And sort of by November, do you still think this will be a pressing issue for voters? Well, one, I think it absolutely will be. And again, now Texas has, you know, more stories are coming out of Texas. I mean, everything from I remember talking to docs in, in El Paso about women coming in to um, Planned Parenthood offices because they had miscarried and were turned away from the hospital. I mean, these are the kinds of things in this um, essentially uh, fear-based um, you know, state where women have no idea where to get the care they need. That's going to continue. There is nothing about these laws that is going to get better. And in fact, I think the evidence is, is going to continue to mount. Um, I know the Tribune has been following this um, issue, and it has been kind of remarkable to me to see the surge in women's interest in voting, women's participation in the election. And uh, I do think it's a, it, this, is, this is not even a close case. I mean, Beto O'Rourke is a strong advocate, not just for abortion rights, but for women's access to health care. There's so many other areas in Texas that, frankly, if if Greg Abbott had spent an iota of, of, of energy on issues like maternal mortality, um, having healthy pregnancies, expanding Medicaid uh, for women who are new moms, but none of that. They've spent all of their time focusing on abortion and making it illegal, and it's just simply unpopular. And um, so I, I think it's going to be not only an issue that is impactful this November, I think it's going to be an issue that's going to impact um, the presidential election um, to a little bit more than two years from now, as more and more states begin to look like Texas, where women, frankly, have lost the right to make their own personal decisions about their pregnancies. Right. Yes, I think, right, it's a, this is not a, a one uh, headline story, right? This is going to keep unfolding right. over the coming years. I mean, that is, and, and I mean, not that I was prescient, but that's what I predicted when this happened. It wasn't just going to be, oh, there's going to be a Supreme Court decision Everyone's going to get all hot and bothered for a hot second, and then we're going to move on to something else. I mean, we are seeing week after week, month after month, new abortion bans uh, taking place, being enacted in states, in states where people thought this could never happen. Um, and of course, you know, I think now that the Republican Party is so enthralled with the extreme wing of their party, they can't stop. And so I think as we see the legislative sessions begin next next year, next January, there will be a whole new you know a round of abortion bans, and I think in some states, including Texas, we will see efforts to ban um, uh, other kinds of birth control that the far right doesn't approve of. These restrictions of saying people can't leave their own state, they can't get legal information that. Uh, having, you know, surveillance on people's internet history. I'm telling you, this is not, this is not Texas. Um, this is not what people want. And um, I mean, it may take, take a while for this all to take political effect, but I think it's going to be um, extremely problematic for the Republican Party. Um, on that, you know, you founded the Texas Freedom Network before yes. you worked at Planned Parenthood, which is on the front lines of another fight around, you know, what's being taught in Texas public schools. Which is unbelievable to me that this is, I mean, just I, when we started the Texas Freedom Network, I thought, okay, this is a 10-year project to just sort of restore 
sort of normalcy to the you know what's curriculum process and public education but here we are again yeah how when did you found it how long has it oh been? my gosh it's been forever ago um i mean i really founded it right after my mom um was defeated um for re-election as governor um in 1994 and at the time i mean this is so it's kind of incredible because you think how are we repeating this history but the extreme right had um focused on the state board of education had elected people that had no no history with public schools, actually didn't even believe in public education, elected them to the State Board of Education and started fighting about everything from evolution to, you know, including the works of major uh, African-American authors into, uh, you know, literature textbooks, stuff that you thought, this is really, really nuts. But now we're seeing, again, I think with this republic, the rightward tilt of the Republican Party in Texas, that they're going after the same issues in public education, in our textbooks, like wanting to suppress information um, from our kids. It's just, it's remarkable. Right. I mean, that's been like this 30 year fight, right? I mean, Correct. longer, but Correct. you know, you got Correct. involved, you know, 30 years on that, abortion access obviously has been, you know, a decades long fight. Right. Uh, you know, now we're seeing, you know, things like new, um, you know, the treatment of trans youth, we're seeing, Correct. you know, sort of these new issues. It's so many fronts for Democrats to be fighting on against this, you know, sort of, like I said, powerhouse Republican establishment. Do you feel like there is sort of a cohesive strategy from the Democrats in Texas that can take on all these fronts at once? Well, I do think, um, I think Beto has really um, sort of landed that, um, if you will, kind of middle ground, which is, and it's funny, you know, I mean, I was born in Waco. I grew up in Dallas and spent, I mean, I've lived in every, I've lived in East Texas. I've lived in Houston. Texans and my, you know, at least from my point of view, are a live and let live kind of folk. I mean, even if you disagree about politics, the thought that government would somehow now be intruding into the most personal decisions um, of your family is just not what we're about. And so I feel like this, the Republican Party here, um, and then look, it's not just in Texas, you know, they're kind of taking a page from the National Party but they made this drift to the right where now, in fact, you know, the Democratic Party is the party of freedom and liberty. The Republican Party has become the party of government control. And so I actually feel like there is a common thread here, you know, the right to vote, the right to make decisions about um, your personal life, whether it's who you marry, whether it's whether or not you have a family or when you have a family the right to go to public schools. I mean, this is fundamental to who we are as a people. And, and again, I think the issue of um, having reasonable uh, restrictions on guns in a state that um, where people are horrified, um, Texans are horrified what happened not only in Uvalde, but what ha what's happening across the state. I actually think this is the middle of this, to me, this is what m mom would say, you know, I hear America singing. This is this is who we are as a people. And it may take time because of gerrymandering and all the restrictions on voting, which the Republicans have passed. But sooner or later, we're going to right ourselves. And I think that's what Beto's campaign has been about. Mm, yeah. Um, to pivot to your time at Planned Parenthood, you spent 12 years leading, you know, the largest and best known reproductive rights organization in the country. Knowing what we know now, where we stand right now, is there anything you think sort of in hindsight you would have done differently or, you know, any regrets from that time? I mean, I, of course, anyone who does any of this work always has to go back and say, you know, where do we, where do we go wrong? Although it's interesting, and I'm sure much has been read, you know, read and written about this, but if Donald Trump hadn't won that extremely close election, um, we would have had three appointees on the Supreme Court um, under a Hillary Clinton you know, administration that would have made all the difference. And so I do think there are some things you go, there are some things out of your control. Unfortunately, Eleanor, the, what in some ways, if I have regrets, is that I didn't sound the alarm loud enough. You know, I remember, um, you know, we fought very hard at Planned Parenthood to get birth control access for everyone under the Affordable Care Act. And which seems like, well, how obvious is that? I mean, almost everyone uses birth control. It's very popular. Men like it, women like, people like it. 
um, it was a huge fight. And it was really hard to convince people, oh, no, no, no. The Republican Party isn't only coming for access to abortion. They're coming after birth control. They're coming after um, your ability to make decisions about your marriage and um, about um, having having kids when you have kids. And now I, and it's time, people would look at you and think, you know, you're literally, you know, you're so far out there. Um, you're paranoid, whatever. And now, of course, I want to say we just weren't paranoid enough. And I think there is part of me, too, to be honest, that thought, um, and I've talked to Republicans about this now, like, I think some of us thought, okay, there's going to be an adult in the room, finally. There's going to be someone who goes, okay, this has gone too far. And I think some people have tried that. I mean, I think Mitt Romney uh, tried that. Obviously, Liz Cheney has tried that. Um, but the the infrastructure of the Republican Party has now become so co-opted by the extreme part of the party that what I think of as the you know the adults in the room uh, have been unable to shake it. And obviously, Donald Trump gets a lot of lot of credit for that. But I know Republicans in Texas. I, this is not what they want either. And um, and I think it's just. That to me is, I just never thought they would go this far, but now they have, and now we have to expose it, and now we have to organize and restore sort of rational policy to Texas and to the country. And, you know, we should say that there's also now a lawsuit from the architect of, you know, Texas's Senate Bill 8, that a federal lawsuit seeking to challenge the contraception mandate in Correct. the Affordable Care Act. So, you know. Yes. No, it's not, I mean, this is, and, you know, it's sometimes people ask me, Okay, so you asked me the hard question, which was like, what are the things I should have done differently? And and then sometimes people will ask, well, what was the best thing that happened? Sure. We, we could also ask and that. What well, is the and best I'll just thing? go ahead, since I asked myself, <laughs> I'll say, I, I mean, that to me was getting birth control covered under the Affordable Care Act. It was literally millions and millions of people got access to no-cost birth control, which, of course, is the number one way to prevent unintended pregnancy. Um, to provide people access to care that they might otherwise not be able to afford. It was a huge victory, but it was a huge fight. And so it doesn't surprise me that the Republican Party would now be trying to undo that. Um, I mean, why would we treat birth control and access to birth control, totally voluntary, uh, different than all other uh, medical care? But that's that's where the Republican Party is. Right, right. Um... Right. We're sort of starting to see the landscape. And I think we're starting yes. to like have more uh, frank discussions, uh, you know, from Republicans and people on, um, you know, in the anti-abortion movement about, you know, where the next frontiers are. Right. Well, and I mean, I know that it's convenient right now for uh, the Republican Party to say, well, abortion is just going to be a state's issue. And I again, I now I, I do know well enough. I'm not going to just sit back and listen to that. I have to say it's actually not going to be a state's issue as soon as the Republican Party controls Congress and if they win the presidency. This will be an abortion ban, particularly even this January, I believe. If, if the Republicans gain control of the Senate and House, an abortion ban will be part of their first, um, their first efforts. So it's not, uh, you know, for all the great work that's being done in many states to try to make sure that there is a safe haven and a place for people to go who need access to safe and legal abortion, uh, that could all go away overnight if the Republican Party nationally is in control. Yeah. Um, you know, you obviously got your start as a local and state level organizer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been criticism of a lot of the national reproductive rights organizations that there just wasn't enough attention being paid to sort of state level advocacy. Mm -hmm. There was a story in the New York Times or a essay, you know, entitled like Where the Pro-Choice Movement Went Wrong. And Diana Gomez, the advocacy director for Progress Texas, was quoted as saying, you know, we were screaming and nobody was there to hear us. Do you think Planned Parenthood, when you were there and, you know, now into the future, has done enough to sort of, um, you know, tend to those relationships with local organizers, independent clinics and advocates? I mean, there's obviously always things that, you know, more that could have been done. But I mean, one of, I guess because I was from Texas um, or I am from Texas and I, I worked in Congress for a while. I worked for Nancy Pelosi and I know, um, and I know that from even working here in the state capital, Texas, everybody who, who is in office up there, they came from somewhere else. And if we don't build power uh, where people come from, Members of Congress didn't really care what I had to say. They wanted to know what were folks saying back in Houston or what were people saying back in Waco. Um, we invested um, 
it, a, a lot in building advocacy strength um, and frankly invested in young people all across the country, including in Texas. Um, I don't think, so I feel good, I feel really good about that. And in fact, I could like, I could name many of the heroines of this state who have done battle with the state legislature. I will say, um, in writ large, that the, I, th I don't know what it is, I think women um, and a lot of organizations that represent women, obviously reproductive rights organizations aren't only focused on women, but primarily, there is a resistance to really talking about building power and building political power. And that's one of the reasons I went to Planned Parenthood is we were the absolute best at providing reproductive health care in the country. I mean, you know, um, but we were increasingly unable to provide that care because of the politics of the, the cities and towns and states that we worked in. And so if we didn't build political power, it would be impossible. We would have never gotten um, the Affordable Care Act to protect abortion rights and to get birth control without having built political power. So I think if there was one thing I would say, just for all of us, is we have to be clearer about um, it's not enough to litigate. It's not enough to um, be excellent at um, healthcare provision. We have to be willing to like roll our sleeves up and get into the business of building political power or else we are going to continue to live under minority um, rule. And that's essentially what's happened in this country. Right, right. You know, what, obviously you talk about this like huge victory on the federal level with the ACA. What is that frontier looking like right now? I mean, what would you like to see the federal government doing? What would you like to see the Biden administration doing? I think there, it's kind of actually, it, it underscores the question you just asked, which is, I mean, there are a lot of things that they can be doing and I think they are. I mean, whether it's um, ensuring ability of people to travel to places where they need to get abortion access, making it easier to get medication abortion, which is now, a majority of uh, abortions in this country are done through medication. So there are a number of things that they can do. But at the end of the day, if we aren't building state-based political power, that will all go away um, in, in a, just a nanosecond. And so to me, what we need to be investing in is things like you know, the, what happened in Kansas, you know, people investing in local organizers, you know, talking to their neighbors, that, we didn't win that election, that referendum on abortion in Kansas because of some, you know, um, TV ad. That was because people literally were talking to their friends and neighbors, going door to door, telling them what was at stake. And of course, we now know 20% of the voters that voted in that referendum didn't even vote on the rest of the primary ballot. They were motivated. And I know that from my time at Planned Parenthood, where we defeated abortion bans on the ballot in South Dakota, in Mississippi, very, very conservative states, um, states like the ones you come from, right? These are places where if we aren't serious about building across party lines, across geography, um, the kind of, um, frankly, the 80% of this country who believes that abortion is a personal decision that should be made by uh, people and their healthcare providers, if we don't do that, no one at the national level is coming to save us. We have to do that work, and that's really what I'm focused on. Yeah. Do you see that happening in Texas now? I mean, are you are you feeling that momentum? Well, um, I do, and I, I think that I, I'm really excited, actually, to be here um, doing a number of things with folks, um, local health care providers, um, local advocates. To me, I feel like, but this is a time, too. We have to, you know, we need to bring people with us. Right. And I, I think that there is a broad uh, group of people in the state of Texas. Again, they're not all of one party. They're not all of one point of view. Um, and we really, uh, you know, mom used to always say, people don't do things for your reasons. They do things for their reasons. And I think it's really a moment to be listening and engaging people who are not now part of the reproductive justice and rights movement. Right. They maybe have been sitting on the sidelines because they thought, other, they thought this was a settled issue. Now that it's not, it's never been more important to invest in the state of Texas um, to bring this massive uh, majoritarian coalition together and reestablish uh, Texas as a place that uh, respects the rights of all people to make their, make their own decisions about their pregnancy. Mm, yeah. Uh, your mother's own career was marked, you know, uh, by the fight for reproductive access. Include, I'm thinking yes. about you know, her early days working for Sarah Weddington, the right. lawyer who argued right. Roe v. Wade. Um, 
I mean, what would she make of this I moment? Know. I know. I mean, look, I think she she was um, she was a passionate believer in reproductive rights, but not only reproductive rights, voting rights, civil rights, um, LGBTQ rights, all of the things that I think both rep, you know her campaign was about, um, and frankly, her government was about. I mean, she appointed more people of diverse backgrounds than all the previous governors in Texas combined. Um, so she was an idealist and she was also incredibly pragmatic. And she would recognize that what's happened here is a political minority putting their own politics and their own um, electoral uh, wins ahead of the people of Texas. And in some ways, I think mom wouldn't be surprised because she'd seen it all. But I do believe she she was such a um, she was such a believer in the people of Texas and the grassroots of Texas. I think she would love what Beto is doing. In fact, Beto's going to counties that I remember going to with mom. Counties where they go, <laughs> mom used to say they'd come out to see her at the county courthouse because she was sort of like the the three legged you know calf at the at the county fair. Because people say, you mean there's a progressive woman governor? <laughs> running for, for the governorship it's like of Texas. like a circus show. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that um, that that's what she believed in. And, and also that you don't get anything you don't fight for. And to me now, look, um, the, this, is, this is where we are at. You know, no crying in baseball. This is time for people to, if they believe and they want, particularly I think of, like, I think of women of a certain age, my age, you know, I have three kids. Um, and I want them to have every opportunity uh, that I had. Um, I want every young person of their generation to have those opportunities. And to me, that's what we're fighting for. At the end of the day, and I don't think it's been discussed enough, this was a constitutional right that was taken away from people after nearly 50 years, strictly because of po politics. This was a political decision. Um, but what it really did was rob an entire generation of young people in this country of their ability to, to sort of have their future and live their dreams. I mean, we know that when abortion became legal in the United States, um, more women were able to finish high school. You know, teenage pregnancy uh, was reduced. More women finished college. Now a majority of law school students are women. They became astronauts. They became you know, uh, actresses, they became vice president of the United States. All of this change um, can directly be connected to the ability to decide when and whether to have kids. And that's what I think is what we're losing sight of a bit. Um, this is about opportunity. This is about the freedom to live your own life on your own terms. And that's what I think we have to, um, we have to keep focused on. It's what makes me hopeful, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the kind of it's the kind of state Texans want, and you didn't ask, but I'll tell you this because some people say, "Well, what? Why do you feel like even optimistic?" It is because the number of young people that I see active in this fight. You know, they are not going to sit back and let their future be taken away from them, and that includes here in the state of Texas. I think often about your mother saying, you know, when asked, you know, if she would have done anything differently, if she'd known she'd be a one term governor, <laughs> right, she would have raised more hell. I mean, what is your advice right now for people who are motivated, people who are, um, you know, getting involved in this fight for the first time, who are, you know, interested in raising a little hell in Texas? No, um, she did believe that. In fact, um, you know, it's interesting because she was a Texan. She lived her whole life. She just got more radical the older she got when she realized, oh, nothing is ever finished, right? No, no victory is ever really won. No right is ever really secure. And of course, what we're talking about today is, is perfect evidence of that. Um, so she did believe in raising hell. I believe it too. I mean, I wrote a whole book about it, <laughs> Make Trouble. Um, and I, uh, I, I guess that's what if when I when I talk to folks now, it's it's like there is this enormous panic. I mean, people will stop me in you know uh, on the subway or you know in the airport and just say, "What are we supposed to do?" And I think the important thing is to know, just do more, do more, whatever you're doing, um, do a little bit more. And 
it's going to take all of us doing that. This isn't, we didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get, we're not going to get out of this fix overnight. But I look at, you know, there was a young woman I, I met here in Austin at one of the first abortion rallies against SB7. She was a seventh grader, Vienna. She'd organized her junior high and here, or like her classmates, and here she was on the steps of the Capitol, you know, um, trying to organize the rest of us. Um, young women I've met in Mississippi and in Florida, um, they can't change the Supreme Court, but they can go door to door in Mississippi and ensure that people are getting out to vote or that people know what's happening. Um, this young woman, Chriselle, I met in Florida, who uh, not only does health fairs, but also uh, registers people to vote and takes people to Tallahassee to fight against the state legislature. So I guess it's, it's, it is kind of raising hell, but a lot of people don't really want to raise hell. They just want to make change, and that's okay. Um, I think that the other, to me too, I mean, look, I've been very privileged. I've had a life of being able to just essentially um, fight for the things I believed in. Uh, and one thing I will tell you, like win or lose, it feels better to be doing something than to just be, you know, railing at the TV. And so, yeah, I just say like, turn the TV off, go out, volunteer for Beto O'Rourke, knock some doors, um, go support a local um, abortion fund that's trying to help people across the country, mentor a young person, um, let young people in Texas know you're there for them. I find one of the one of the most horrifying things about what's happening is young people feeling like they are alone um, and have no one to turn to. So um, we can all do that. And um, and and at some point, this this too uh, will pass. This will change, but it's not going to do it. It's not going to happen on its own. So whatever you're doing, do more. It's do more. Yeah. And also, I mean, my favorite like like recent sort of, I guess, uh, realization is. Um, don't wait for instructions. Um, you know, start before you're ready, <laughs> because no one is coming to save us, and this is something that we can all do um, on our own and and do together. And look, you'll meet the most amazing people on the way. <laughs> At least I have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Oh, we really sure. appreciate it, Eleanor. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Yeah, and thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the festival.